in our quest to live lighter on the earth and avoid environmental catastrophe, a great challenge looms before us. Renewable energy is central to the solution, but energy from the sun or wind is limited if we don't have an effective way of storing this energy through downtimes. Could it be that the solution to this existential problem is right here in Vancouver? Our city has an unusual cluster of electrochemical experts, a legacy from the pulp and paper industry. And our next guest just may be on the verge of converting this unique advantage into something very significant. Please welcome Matt Harper. Well, thanks, Sam, and uh, thanks to Lynn and everyone else who's been involved in pulling this together tonight. And, and look, I think that this event is such a phenomenal part of our civic fabric, and I want to thank all of you for taking part, for coming out and sharing in this dialogue. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> right. <clears throat> okay, now you don't need to clap for me anymore. Perfect. Some of the most amazing advances in human progress have been made by our ability to control our resources and to control those resources both in where we use them and to control those resources in when we use them. If you think about prehistoric times, you know, we were able to move from the plains up into caves because we were able to collect water in earthenware bowls and carry it with us. Um, if you think about um, if you think about some of the great advances in politics and philosophy and science, it was the critical mass of cities where those ideas were able to, 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 to build and become part of, uh, part of our history. And those cities were only possible because of the aqueducts bringing water into cities like Rome and Athens. In the last 300 years, uh, humankind's uh, mobility and industry has made all of our lives better by um, allowing us the, the, the goods that allow us to live better lives, the ability to travel, to experience other cultures and different people. That has been facilitated by our ability to store and transport fuels. Now, over the last 130 years, what we've seen is our electricity system has brought us most of the things that we refer to as modern conveniences. And um, the electric grid is the thing that has brought that energy into our homes. And the electric grid is an amazing machine. It's the most complex machine humankind has ever built. Any hour of any day, there are millions of people around the world working to make sure that the 6.3 billion people who have access to electricity can walk over to a wall, flip a switch, and have light come on. It's an incredible achievement. But what we've never mastered is the ability to control electricity in time. The way the electricity system works right now is that electricity is generated the instant it is consumed. It travels at the speed of light from generation to consumption. Think of it this way. Imagine, a, imagine if the world we lived in was one where water had to be consumed the instant it fell from the sky. That's what our electricity system is today. Now, up until now, this hasn't mattered because um, we make electricity by burning stuff. We burn gas, we burn coal, we burn oil, we burn whatever we want, and we control when that burning happens. So we're able to make an estimate of how much, stuff, how much electricity we're going to need, and then we can burn as much stuff as we want when we want it. Well, the problem with that is that the negative environmental impacts and impacts on our ecosphere of that burning are starting to catch up with us. And we're seeing increased toxins in the environment, um, and we're seeing increased carbon emissions into our atmosphere. 25% of our carbon emissions are currently used, are, are currently produced by generating electricity. That's more than transportation. That's more than industrial usage. That's the biggest single category of CO2 generation in the world today. And if we don't do something about that, we are going to have a very, very hard time mitigating climate change. So, fortunately, in the last couple of years, there's been this amazing revolution in renewable energy. And, you know, we've seen the massive rollout of, you know, wind power plants and solar power plants 
Um, you know, these are, these are installations you can now see from space. These are massive efforts. But the problem with these devices is that they are not under our control. They generate when they want to generate. When the sun is out, the solar panels make power. When the wind is blowing, the, we, get, we get power from our wind generators. So that has created an incredible amount of instability in areas that are using more and more renewable power. Um, we see tremendous instability in the markets that support our electricity system. Um, we see tremendous uh, instability in the amount of power available. So you start seeing blackouts in places like California and Australia where uh, there's a tremendous amount of this renewable energy being used. So if we're going to continue down this path, we need to find a way to control when electricity is used in time. So why can't we just do this? I mean, we all have, we all know, we all know what batteries are. We know we have them on our cell phones, and we have them in our cars, and we have them in this wonderful little device here. The the, the problem with the batteries that we have right now is again related to the sophistication and maturity of the electric grid. The electric grid is made up of devices that are unbelievably reliable and that last for a very, very, very long period of time. We have hydro generating facilities here in BC that have been in operation for over a hundred years. The batteries that we have today are devices, you know, made to be used for a couple of years. You know, you get a new cell phone, you use it for two or three years, you know, the charge starts to suck, so you go and upgrade to a new one. Um, but that kind of device is not going to give us the low-cost, reliable energy that we need on the grid. So what do we do about this? Well, there's a number of people, myself included, lots of people around the world are starting to talk about what we refer to as grid-connected energy storage, or just energy storage for short. That's terrible branding, okay, elastic store energy, fair enough. But, you know, energy storage is how the, this nascent industry is being described. And what these, what are essentially very large batteries do, is they're able to store for much longer periods a, as, as a resource that's appropriate for supporting our current electric grid. My company, Avalon Battery, is building and designing and constructing these devices right here in East Vancouver. And what we're building is devices uh, called a vanadium flow battery, uh, which is a hybrid essentially of conventional battery technologies and fuel cell technologies, where we're able to do the regular charge and discharge that normal batteries do, but to do that tens of thousands of times over decades, which is exactly the kind of resource we need if we're going to decouple the time of electricity use consumption on the grid. In doing this work, we are tapping into, as Sam mentioned, into some of the great pioneering work in electrochemical engineering and product development that has been done right here in Vancouver. Um, you know, in recent memory, companies like Ballard, Ballard Power Systems, but going back in history to the, the chloralkali uh, capabilities that were built to support our pulp and paper industry in the 60s and 70s has all been part of this pioneering work that's led us to where we are today. So, we're not going to be the only part of this. There are going to be many different solutions for making sure that this decoupling can happen. But ultimately, we believe that being able to, be, to by being able to store energy, we're going to make renewable energy reliable, and we're going to be able to provide clean, reliable energy for our cities, for our industry, and for ourselves in the future. Thank you. <laughs>